Puru became the king. From there, his descendants later on came to be known as Kurus, from which both the Pandavas and the Kauravas come. The whole story is about this clan of people. From Puru down, a few generations down, you have definitely heard of Vishwamitra for all the wrong reasons. Vishwamitra was a king who was then known, uh, known as Kaushika, looked at the rishis, the sages, the power that they had. Somehow he felt the power of the king is too little compared to the power of the sages. So he wanted to become a sage though he was born a king. So he took to the forest and started doing serious austerities. The intensity with which he was going, Indira felt if he achieves to what he is aspiring for, his own supremacy will be in danger. So he sent his honey trap agents. He sent Menaka. Menaka's job was to seduce Vishwamitra and distract him from his austerities and sadhana, which he successfully did and they bore a child, which is this girl child. And Vishwamitra became furious because after that much of time, he realized that all that he had earned through his sadhana, he lost because of this distraction. So he gave up the mother and the child and walked away. And Menaka being an apsara, that she's just a visitor, her visa <laughs> is of a limited period. She wants to go back and she can't leave the girl with the father because the father doesn't want. So she left the girl on the banks of river Malini and went away. The shakun birds who noticed this little girl somehow took to the girl and they protected the girl from other creatures and kept her that way for some time. Then Sage Kanva, who came that way, saw this strange situation where a little infant was being protected by the birds. So he picked up this child and because she was being protected by the Shakun birds, he called her Shakuntala and took her to the ashram and brought her up. She grew up into a fine young woman and one day Dushyanta, the king, went on a campaign, a battle and on the way back he wanted to feed his soldiers, so he came into the forest hunting indiscriminately, killing as many as he can to feed the army. And he particularly shot a very large male stag. His arrow found its mark, but the stag ran away, so he followed. And the stag he found in the hands of Shakuntala, it was her pet stag and she was nursing it with great compassion, when he saw this, he fell in love with her and stayed back there for some time. And with Kanva's permission, he married her there and then he had to go back because his whole army was waiting at the edge of the forest. Then he said he will go back, set things right in his kingdom and come back. And as a mark of remembrance, and as a mark of the marriage consumed, he took out his official ring and put it on Shakuntala. Naturally, it did not fit properly and he left. He said, I'll come back for you. So Shakuntala was in a dream. This forest girl suddenly became a queen, an empress. So she was constantly in a dream mode. So she was sitting in a dream mode, sage Durvasa, came to Kanva's ashram, you heard of Durvasa. He's an angry man. He came, 
he addressed her, but she was in a dream state, eyes open, but she couldn't see anything. So he felt that she's insulting him and he said, whoever is holding your attention right now, may he forget you forever. Then she came to her senses, she cried, it cannot be, why did you do this? And then people in the ashram explain how she's been married to the king and she's waiting for him to come and take her and she was in a dream, daydreaming state, please pardon her. Then by then, hospitality was taken care of for Durvasa and he was little cooler. Then he said, okay, let me correct it. Yes, he's forgotten you, but the moment you show some kind of a memento, the moment you show something that reminds him of you, he will remember. So Shakuntala waited and waited, but Dushyanta never came. So she bore a child whom she called as Bharata. It is his name the nation carries today. This is known as Bharat or Bharatvarsh because the nation is named after this emperor for his many qualities, many, many. I will not go into it because it's too many. He was an ideal human being. So he grew up in the forest. Dushyanta never came. And one day Kanva said it's appropriate that you go and ask the king, remind the king that you are his wife and you have a son. It is not appropriate that a king's son is growing up not being in touch with his father. So, taking this young boy, Shakuntala went towards the palace. They had to cross a river. She was still in a dream love affair. So dreaming, as she was crossing the river in a boat, she put her hand out just to feel the water and the oversized ring. went away into the river. She did not even realize this. She went there, she was innocent of the ways of the kings and palaces. She went there into the king's court and when Dushyanta asked, who are you? He said, well, don't you remember I'm your wife, Shakuntala, this is your son. Dushyanta became furious, how dare you, who are you? to even say such things and she was ousted out of the place. She did not realize what's happened. He loved me so much and now what has happened? He's completely blanked out his memory. She came back and she was distressed. For the first time she had a brush with the society and she went deeper into the forest from the ashram and she just lived with his son and the wilderness around her. Bharata grew up with the wild animals, very brave, very strong, very much a part of the earth upon which he lived. One day Dushyanta came hunting into that forest, and then he saw a young boy playing with full-grown lions, riding elephants. Then he looked at him and asked, who are you? Are you some kind of a superhuman being? Are you a god? Have you come from somewhere? Then the boy said, no, I am Bharata, the son of Dushyanta. He said, I am Dushyanta. How come I don't know who you are? <laughs> then Kanva came and explained the whole story and he remembered and he took Shakuntala and took her back and Bharata, they had many sons, but his own biological sons, he looked at them as they grew up and he said, these are unfit to be kings. He had five sons, each one of them, he checked them and he said, these cannot make good kings for my citizens. This is the first time a king is showing a wisdom where just biological connections are not good enough to be a king. Just because 
you are born to a king, you need not be a king, he manifested this. This was greatly valued and this is one reason why his name was given to the nation because he discarded his own children and looked for an appropriate king. And he found the illegitimate son of Brahaspati called Vitata, who was born to Mamata who was Brahaspati's brother's wife. Brahaspati, in a moment of absolute indiscretion, forced himself upon this woman and Vitata is a kind of a victim of rape and he chose that boy as the king and Vitata became a great king and ruled for his lifetime with great wisdom and balance. So Bharata was celebrated for his balance of mind, for his impartiality, for his sense of inclusion with his citizenry in such a way that he rejected five of his sons and gave his empire to another boy with whom he had nothing to do and an illegitimate son. So Vitata, from there down fourteen generations later, Shantanu. We are coming down to the story now. Shantanu is the grandfather of the Pandavas and Kauravas. Shantanu, in his previous life, was known as Mahabhishek. And he lived a full life and entered Devaloka. He was sitting in Indra's court or Astan. There Ganga, goddess Ganga, came visiting and it so happened, in a moment of unawareness, her dress fell down and her upper body was exposed. And all the other kings, as the proper behavior was at that time, put their heads down. Ganga was unaware of her condition, all the other men put their heads down. But Mahabhishek, who was new to Devaloka, kept staring at her. When Indira noticed this impropriety, that he was staring at Ganga without exhibiting the necessary culture and civilization of being in Devaloka, he said, you are unfit to be in Devaloka. You go back and be born as a human being again. And then he looked at Ganga and he noticed Ganga seemed to be enjoying the attention. He said, this is completely inappropriate. You seem to be enjoying the attention, you also go back. Be born as a human being, go through all the pains and pleasures of being human, go through that phase, when you are free from this pride, you come back. So Mahabhishek was born as Shantanu. Shantanu is to meet Ganga, but he is not aware. He's Memories of previous lives are not in him, but it is there in Ganga. So Ganga is trying to draw him towards him, but being a king, he is wandering all over. Shantanu was a fine hunter. For him, hunting was his worship. When he went hunting, he became so one with that act. For him, his hunt was his worship. The river Ganga was flowing by. But he's not a fisherman, he's a hunter. So he has no attention towards the river. His attention is towards the hunt. Ganga waited. For weeks on end, he hunted on the banks of Ganga, not paying attention to her. Then when thirst overtook him, the problem is, whenever he's thirsty or hungry, whatever, there are people supplying, so he doesn't go to the river. One day thirst overtook him in such a way and no soldiers or no any of the people who serve him were around. So then he thought of the river, came in search of Ganga. So Ganga arose from the river as a woman. The moment he set his eyes upon her, he completely fell in love with her, once again love took over.
On a certain day, the king of Chedi, Upurichara, was in the forest hunting and as he spent weeks on his hunt, he bore a child upon a fisher girl. She delivered twins. These two were named as Matsya Raja and Matsya Gandhi. Out of these twins, the king chose to take the boy with him and the left the girl back with the fisher folk. So she grew up as Matsya Gandhi, that means the smell of fish. No, not always bad. It depends where you come from. So she was growing up in another place. Then Santanu met Ganga and he requested her, he pleaded her, please marry me. Ganga set a condition, I will marry you, but no matter what I do, you should never ask why. You should never ask me as to why I'm doing what, whatever I do. Anybody up for a wife? <laughs> Santanu was so madly in love with her, he said, yes, I will never ask whatever. So she became his wife, an incredibly beautiful and wonderful wife, and then she became pregnant. She delivered a fine son and at the first instant she took the child, walked to the river and drowned the child. Santanu couldn't believe this, that his firstborn son was drowned by his wife. His heart burst out but he remembered, if he asked her, why did you do this, she will leave. The man who was floating around in joy and love became grief-stricken, afraid of his wife. But still he loved her so much and they lived. One more child came. She delivered another son, without a word, took this child and drowned him in the river. He was on the verge of insanity, he couldn't take it anymore, but he knew if he says one word, she will leave. The second child was drowned, the third one was drowned, it continued. Shantanu was completely horror-stricken. He looked at his wife in terror, no more in love, because newborn children, she takes them and drowns them in the river. Seven of them were drowned. The eighth one was born, helplessly. Santanu followed her to the river. When she was just about to do it, he went and grabbed the child and he said, Enough! Why are you doing this inhuman act? Ganga said, You have broken the condition. It's time for me to go. But I owe you an explanation. Let me tell you why. You have heard of Sage Vasishta. Sage Vasishta, was living in his ashram and he had a certain cow which had divine qualities which was known or named as Nandini. One day, certain versus, versus means that generally the scripture goes about describing uh, them as people who flew around in vimanas or some kind of crafts, they flew around. In their crafts are being described in great detail, how they flew, how they landed, what they look like, everything. They're even going to the extent of saying how the surface was so smooth, like the surface of liquid mercury. And they're saying, at that time light means only fire, they're saying, there were lights inside these crafts which had no fire, which had no oil, 
light burned by itself and no horses, the craft was self-driven. These things they couldn't have imagined, okay? Something must have been seen. We don't know, we can neither prove nor disprove, but somebody could not have imagined this just like that. They must have seen something. So Vasus were flying around, eight Vasus along with their wives were kind of holidaying on the planet. They were on vacation. Then they walked through Vasistha's ashram and they saw this cow Nandini with incredible divine qualities. And one of the Vasu wives, whose name was… this Vasu's name was Prabhasa, Prabhasa's wife said, I want that cow. Unthinkingly, Prabhasa said, come, let's get the cow. One or two of them said, but this is not our cow. The cow belongs to a sage, why should we take it? So Prabhasa's wife said, cowards always come up with excuses. You can't get the cow, so you're coming up with dharma. So Prabhasa became very macho and with the help of his companions, they went and stole the cow. When Vasistha realized that his dear cow is being stolen, he caught them and he said, how dare you? You come as guests, we treat you well. In the end you want to steal my cow and go. May you be born as human beings with all the limitations. Let your wings be clipped that you cannot fly. You have to walk upon this earth, earth, you have to carry physical bodies, you have to be born and you have to die like everybody else. So these eight vasus begged Ganga. Anyway, when she was in Devaloka and she got cursed, they begged her, make sure we are born in your womb, make our lives upon that planet as brief as possible. So she said, I was only fulfilling their desire that they did not want to stay upon this planet. They just wanted to be born and be done with the curse. So seven of them I saved, but eighth one you saved. Anyway, this is Prabhasa for you and he is the one who instigated the theft. So maybe he deserves a longer life upon this planet, but because he's an infant, I will take him with me. When he is sixteen, I will bring him back. I will make sure he has finished his education. All that is necessary for him to be a good king, I will teach him and leave him with you when he is sixteen. She took the child and went away. Shantanu became listless and lost. Forlorn, he walked about, lost interest in his kingdom. One who was a great king became a frustrated, depressed man. He simply walked around not knowing what to do. Sixteen years passed and Ganga's and Shantanu's son, who was named as Devavrata, Ganga brought him and handed it over to Shantanu. Devavrata learnt his archery from someone no less than Bhargava or Parushuram himself. And he learnt the Vedas from the Brihaspati. He learnt everything from the best possible teachers, fully ready to be a king. At the age of sixteen, a full-grown young man ready to take on great responsibilities came and when Shantanu saw him, all his depression went away and he took to his son with great love and enthusiasm. And he coronated him as the Yuviraj or as the next king. Now that Devavrata was there and he took on the administration, and he was doing everything well at his behest, he became free. 
once again happy, he went out hunting. Ah. <laughs> he again fell in love. <laughs> By then, this Matsya Gandhi had grown up into a dark, dusky woman, being a fisherman's daughter. His father, the chief of the fisher folk who was known as Dasa, brought her up well and she was operating the boat for people to cross the river. They were on the banks of river Yamuna and Shantanu was moving in that direction. In the meantime, sage Parasha came there and he wanted a boat ride. As he was riding this boat across river Yamuna, he was very deeply drawn to this girl and this young fisher girl also drawn to the sage and she was all the time struggling within herself because her brother, her twin brother is living in the palace. She's among the fisher folk, so she thought if she makes an association with the sage, she may get somewhere and they went and lived on a small island in, in the river Yamuna, a little island. And she bore a child for him who was known as Krishna Dvaipayana, a dark looking child was born. Because he was born on an island, he was called Dvaipayana. Because he was dark, he was called Krishna. So Krishna Dvaipayana who later on came to be known as Veda Vyasa because he compiled the Vedas, who is the teller of this story. So, Parashar took the boy with him and went away. This Matsya Gandhi, one boon that she got from sage Parashar was, he took away the fishy smell <laughs> and gave her that kind of heavenly fragrance that no human being had ever smelt anything like that. She smelt like a flower that did not belong to this earth. So she had this phenomenal fragrance for which they changed her name as Satyavati, she smelled of truth. She smelled of something which is not mundane, she smelled of something which does not belong to this world. And this became her draw and when she was in this condition, Shantanu, who was little, out of his depression, proud of his son, once again happy, he looked at this woman and fell in love with her. Then he went to Satyavati's father and asked for her hand in marriage. Dasa, the chief of the fisher folk, however mean, still a little king by himself. Not a king with a great kingdom, but a king of a small fisher folk community, still he has some politics and calculation in him. When he saw the emperor begging for his daughter's hand, he thought this is a time to make a deal. He said, it's all right, I would be willing, only if my daughter's children will become the future kings of the Kuru dynasty. Shantanu said, how is that possible? I have coronated my son Devavrata. He is an able young man. He is the best king that Kuru kingdom can have. That is not possible. This Willy fisherman looked at the king, saw he was hopelessly in love. He said, then forget about my daughter. Shantanu begged. The more he begged, the more the fisherman realized, this is it. The hook and the sink and the float, everything has sunk. So not the time to give up, time to draw the big fish. He said, it's up to you. If you want my daughter, my daughter's children should be the kings of the future. Otherwise, 
go live happily in your palace. Shantanu went back to the palace, once again a depressed man. He couldn't shake Satyavati off his mind, her fragrance invaded him in such a way that he could… he lost his mind. He lost interest in the affairs of the kingdom, he simply sat down. Devavrata, a dutiful son, looked at his father and asked, Father, what is it that's bothering you? Everything is going great in the kingdom. What is it that is bothering you? Shantanu just shook his head and put his head down in shame, unable to tell his son what is bothering him. The dutiful son that he was, he went and asked the charioteer who took Shantanu hunting, he asked, what happened in the hunt? After this hunt, my father is no more the same man, something has happened to him, what happened? So the charioteer said, I don't know what happened. I took him to this fisher folk's chief's house. Your father walked into his house and when he walked out, he was like a ghost. He walked in as a king with great enthusiasm. He was full of love, I can see he's fallen in love with this woman. But when he walked out, he was a ghost, I don't know what happened. So Devabrata went there and found out what had happened. When Dasa said, this is all it is, it's a simple demand. He wants my daughter, all I'm saying is her children should be the kings of the future. It's a simple condition, but the only problem is you are standing in the way. Bhishma said, that is no problem, I need not be the king. I promise I will not be the king, I'll never be the king in my life. Let Satyavati's children be the kings. The fisherman smiled and said, that is fine. As a young man out of your bravado, you can say these things. But tomorrow when you have children, your children will fight. So this is not possible. Devarvata thought, what is this? I am telling you, I will not be the king. Let Satyavati's children be the king. What more do you want? He said, that is not it. You will have children. I will not be there to extract a promise from them tomorrow. Devarvata said, I will never marry, I will never have children to ensure that Satyavati's children will have the right to be the kings. The fisherman was having his meal, carefully taking the bones of the fish. He looked up and said, young man, I appreciate everything that you're saying but you do not know the ways of life. You may not marry, but you may still have children <laughs> Then Devavrata took the extreme step of castrating himself. He castrated himself and took a vow, I will never have children, I am incapable of having children, will this satisfy you? Then the fisherman said, yes. Then everybody said, this is the harshest thing a man can do to himself. So they called him Bhishma, one who took the harshest treatment upon himself. Not forced into it, willingly took such a step. So he was called Bhishma and Shantanu married Satyavati. With Satyavati, he had two children. The first one was known as Chitrangada, the second was known as Vichitravirya. Chitrangada, an arrogant young man, went out one day into the forest, a Gandharva. Gandharva means beings who came from elsewhere with extraordinary skills, who also had the same name Chitrangada, 
When this Gandharva asked this boy, who are you? He proudly said, I am Chitrangara. Gandharva laughed and said, how dare you call yourself Chitrangada? I am Chitrangada. You better change your name. This is my name. You are unfit to carry my name. If at all, if anybody carries my name, it will be my son, not you. Take away your name. So this young prince stood up and said, how dare you say, it looks like you've lived too long. Come, let us fight because my father has named me Chitrangada and this is my name. Gandharva said there can be only one Chitrangada. They fought. In a moment, the boy was dead and the Gandharva left. So there was only one son left, Vichitravirya. Vichitravirya means, Vichitra means strange or could be distorted. Virya means masculinity. So he is a strange masculinity or distorted masculinity. We don't know exactly what, either he was a Enuk or he was very weak or he was a homosexual, either unwilling to get a wife or incapable of getting a wife. This getting a wife, getting a child, don't look at it in today's context, it is the most important thing at that time. Because being a king, the first concern is that they must have sons. Because otherwise, who is next in the lineage? Every day you're going out into the battle, whoever you may be, you may get killed. If you get killed, do you have a son or not is a very, very important aspect. So that's why they're always thinking about at the earliest possible age, take a wife and have a son because if you don't have a son, your whole empire will go somewhere else. So Vichitravirya was unwilling to take a wife. Bhishma is unwilling to take a wife. So Kuru dynasty is at a standstill. But now the concern of the Kuru dynasty that there is no progeny, Bhishma is out. He is there taking care of everything for his whole life. He remains the regent, never to become a king. Taking care of everything, taking care of everybody, but he cannot sit on the throne and rule. Chitrangada is dead. Vichitravirya is unwilling to find a bride. In this situation, the king of Kashi announced the Swayambara of his three daughters and they did not send an invitation to the Kuru house. The Kuru dynasty is the biggest and the most respected in the region, but they did not get an invitation for the Swayambara. Bhishma was inflamed. They did not send the invitation because they don't want their girls to be married to Vichitravirya about whose masculinity there is rumors. So Bhishma, could not take this affront because Bhishma is committed to his country, to the Kuru dynasty, above his own well-being, above anybody's well-being. He is a patriot. So, to correct this affront, he went to the Swayambara. Swayambara was in progress. The word Swayambara means the young woman is allowed to choose her own destiny. So when a princess has to marry, they will set up a, a kind of an event where anybody who thinks they're eligible in the Kshatriya clan, when I say Kshatriya clan, this is a warrior class of people. And the young woman can choose her husband, it's her choice, nobody intervenes in this. There are three girls, all the three sisters have come to Swayambara at once. Eighteen, sixteen, fifteen, three girls, Amba, Ambika, Ambalika. The eighteen-year-old one has already fallen in love. The king of Shalva, whose name was Salva, Salva is his name, Shalva is the kingdom. So, 
she has already fallen in love with him and she can choose him on that day. So first the older girl is to choose and when she, the simple way of choice is that she is given a garland, she looks around at all the men and she will choose one man and garlands that man and he becomes her husband. So she went for Salva and just garlanding him, Bhishma walked into the Swayambara. Other warriors who were sitting there, they fear him because he's a great warrior. At the same time, they know he has castrated himself and he will never marry. So they taunted him, why the old man come here now? Is he looking for a bride? Or why the Kuru house does not have a warrior who can… who can come and take a bride? Is that the reason why he has come? Taunts flew around. Bhishma flew into a rage that his nation and his clan is being ridiculed. So, he kidnapped all the three girls. He abducted all the three girls and took them and the other warriors gave battle. He defeated all of them. Then Salva himself fought because his bride is going away. He defeated him, humiliated him and took all the three and left. Amba, the other two are happy, a brave warrior has abducted them. So this is the change that has happened from the previous generations. Where a woman could set conditions, now she is being grabbed and taken and she is proud of that. So the other two are happy that they are being taken by the Kuru clan. Though the groom who is supposed to win them has not come, an old man has come to win for him. Amba is all teary-eyed. She she told Bhishma, after this battle is over and they continued the journey towards Hastinapur, which is the capital city of the Kurus, she said, what have you done? I was in love with this man and I've al already put my garland on him. He is my husband, you can't take me like this. He said, I have taken. What I take belongs to the Kuru. So she asked, will you marry me? He said, not for me, you will marry with Chitravirya. Forcefully he took him there, took all the three there and marriage happened. The other two married, Ambika and Ambarika. Vichitravirya refused Amba, saying, she placed the garland on somebody else, she has given her heart to somebody, I will not marry this woman. Then Amba asked, what am I supposed to do now? Bhishma said, I am sorry, you go back to Salva. So she happily went back. When she went back, she had a shock. Salva said, I am not here to take charity from somebody, I lost the battle. The old beast defeated me and now he is trying to give my bro… give me a charity bride, I will not take her, you go back. You go back and marry Vichitravirya. No, I have been refused. Okay, you marry Bhishma, but I am not taking you back because I will not take a charity bride. So refused from both places. She again came back to Hastinapur and she insisted, Bhishma, you must marry, you have destroyed my life. You took away the man I loved, you brought me here forcefully and the person whom I am supposed to marry here, he will not marry me. You will not marry me. What is this nonsense? You must marry me. He said, my allegiance is to my nation. I have given word that I will not marry and that's all. In total desolation, she walked out. I want you to imagine, it's five thousand years ago, a princess rejected from everywhere. She cannot go back to her father. She has no husband, so her man is not taking her back. She just went out, not knowing where she's going in absolute desolation. Amba moved from despair to desperation, from desperation to anger, from anger to rage, from rage to thirst for revenge. She went from place to place, 
asking someone who can kill Bhishma. She said, this man destroyed my life. Is there any man, any warrior who is willing to take this man's life? Nobody was willing to have a fight with Bhishma because of his warrior prowess. And another aspect is, when he took this vow of to never to marry and castrate himself, at that time Shantanu said, for what you have done to me today, I will give you a blessing. These eighteen years I have been a brahmachari and I have done certain tapasya, certain sadhana within myself, all the merit that I have earned within myself, all the energy that I have picked it within myself, I will make it into a blessing and offer it to you that in your life you can choose your death. When you have to die, you can choose. Nobody else can decide when you will die, only you can decide when you will die. So with this blessing on his side and the kind of warrior that he was, Nobody was willing to take him on. So Amba went, moved into the Himalayan region and went into deep austerities. She sat upon the snow-clad peaks and went into a deep state of sadhana calling for Kartikeya, the son of Shiva who is a great warrior because in her mind she thought, Kartikeya should be one person who should be able to kill Bhishma. Kartikeya, pleased with her austerity, appeared and when she said, you must kill Bhishma, he said, my time of killing is over. If you do not know this, Kartikeya when he came down south, slaughtering everything that he saw as unjust, in his quest for justice, he went about slaughtering everything that he saw as injustice. And he came to the place which is now known as Subramanya in Karnataka. For the last time he washed his sword and he said, never again this sword will see blood. And he gave up violence in his life and went up the mountain which is today known as Kumar Parvat and left his body there. And in his disembodied state, when she called him, he said, I have shunned violence. I cannot take to kill again. I cannot kill Bhishma, but looking at your plight and your devotion, I will give you a blessing. Here, he gave her a garland of lotuses. He said, you take this garland. Whoever wears this garland will kill Bhishma. Now, with great hope in her heart, once again with this garland in her hands, this garlands have always been a disaster for her. The first time she took the garland, something else happened. Once again another garland, a lotus flower garland, she took it and walked from town to town, village to village. Is there anybody who is willing to wear this garland and kill Bhishma? no man was willing to touch. Then she went in search of Parashurama. Parashurama was the teacher for arms training, for especially for archery. Parashurama was the teacher of Bhishma. When she went and prostrated herself before Parashurama and expressed her plight, Parashurama said, don't you worry, I will fix this for you. He called Bhishma. Bhishma came and prostrated himself. Parashurama said, enough, enough of your vow and your nonsense, just marry this woman. For the first time, Bhishma said, you are my guru. If you ask me to take away my own head, I will do it. But do not ask me to break my vow. I have taken a vow that I cannot break. Why are these people like? You will see continuously, there are men who will take a vow no matter what, life or death, it doesn't matter what it causes, 
they want to keep that word. Why this is so is, these are times from totally uncivilized existence, people are striving to bring civilization. In this effort, a man's word is the most important thing. There are no constitutions written down, there are no penal codes written down. In such a condition, a man's word is the most important thing. If I say something, I do it and do it at any cost. If a man who can't keep his word is not a man because there is no law, when there is no law, a man's word is the only law. So, you will see continuously through the story, when somebody gives a word, they will go to such extraordinary lengths to keep it because if they break that one thing, they will be no more respected, they will be no more considered as worthy of anything. So Bhishma said, for you, my guru, if you want, I will take my head away right now, but I cannot break my vow. Parashurama is not used to disobedience. <laughs> he is obedient, obedient. When his father asked him to take away the heads of all his three brothers and his mother, without a thought he lopped off all the four heads. And then his father was pleased with his obedience and he asked, Okay, you ask for a boon, what do you want? He said, I want the lives of my mother and my brother. So, he gave back the lives. So, obedience or disobedience is one thing that Parashurama cannot take because that's how he is grown up. When he saw Bhishma is unwilling to obey, he went into a rage. He is raged for a long time, he is a super angry man. He took a vow that he will kill every kshatriya that he sees and they say in the Kurukshetra, he left five ponds of blood by slaughtering kshatriyas. Every kshatriya that he saw, he slaughtered them because of the affront that the kshatriyas did to his clan and he left five ponds of blood which kshatriyas believed later on that by taking a dip in these ponds, they would become warriors who were indomitable. <coughs> so Parashurama and Bhishma had a duel. An extraordinary duel happened between them and Parashurama had taught Bhima everything that he knows and he found that he could not beat him. Both of them fought bitterly for days on end, then they found nobody could be the winner. So Parashurama threw up his hands and told Amba, you have to find somebody else. So her journey with the garland continued and she came to Drupada's court. King Drupada, the king of Panchala, was the second largest empire in the Bharatvarsh. She came there and asked Drupada, Drupada did not even want to touch it, did not want to come anywhere near Amba because by now Amba's reputation like a ghost, she's walking from village to village, town to town, thirsting for Bhishma's blood. When Drupada refused to see her, out of total frustration, she hung these lotus flowers. These lotus flowers continue to remain fresh, given by Kartikeya, she hung it on one of the columns in Drupada's palace and left, once again desolate and depressed, straight up to Himalayas. And Drupada was so afraid of this garland, he didn't let anybody touch it. Every day the lit lamps worshipped her like garland, but nobody touched it, nobody had wanted to have anything to do with it. And she continued her journey to the Himalayas. She sat there in great austerity. Slowly, a young woman, her beautiful body wilted down to just bones. She sat there, mere bones and skin, and called for Shiva. Shiva himself 
appeared and she said, you must kill Bhishma. Shiva said, is it not best that you get to kill Bhishma, then you will enjoy the revenge more than me killing him, isn't it? Suddenly her eyes brightened up, her body was just skin and bones, but her eyes brightened up and she said, how is it possible? I am a woman and he is a great warrior, how can I kill him? He said, I will bless you, in your next life you will kill him. Then Amba said, but in my next life I will not remember all this, so I will not know the sweetness of revenge. Shiva said, don't worry, I will make sure that you remember. When the time comes, you will remember, you will know the sweetness of revenge. For all that you have suffered, you will have it. So she sat there and left her body to come back. You heard those western movies, I will be back <laughs> She didn't say that, she quietly left. In the Kuru clan, Vichitravirya dies of consumption soon after his marriage to Ambika and Ambalika. Then once again, another generation left without a progeny, the mother Satyavati. It is her ambition and desire which did what it did, who wants her children to rule. But now her son is dead without a progeny. Now she calls Bhishma and, his, and she says, enough of your vow. You take these two young women who were just married and their husband is dead. You take them as your wives and let the Kuru clan continue. The word Bhishma itself means severe. He took such a severe vow and it's everything to him. You should hear what he has to say. Bhishma said, you don't even begin to know me or what my dharma is. But then how could you? Let me make this clear once and for all, so I never have to repeat myself. The earth may lose her fragrance, water its sweetness, sun may lose his luster, or the moon his enhanced coolness. Lord Dharma of the Devas may abandon his truth, but Bhishma will never break his oath. My oath is everything I live by. That day at your father's hut, my life changed forever. My oath is my truth and truth for me is greater than all anticipated rewards of heaven. So it's not just kingdom that I forsake. I even forsake heavenly possibilities. I even forsake mukti if it's necessary, but I will not forsake my oath. To understand the next part of the story, you must understand this is his state and this state never changes. Because of this one thing, he does many things which he would not have done otherwise. And more than that, he allowed many, many things, horrific things to happen simply because he wouldn't break his word. If he only broke his word, he could have changed the whole situation any time he wanted. But just to keep this one word, he did everything because he is so attached to what he considers his dharma. Because there is no law, every man makes his own law. The word that I speak is my law. 
Now he has spoken this word, no matter what, he will not change it. From this context, the story grows. Bhishma, right from the beginning, looked like he was a very uh, passionate and, as you said, a patriotic man and his… all his life was about his nation. But he made a vow for… also for this. And uh, now what is his dharma to uphold the traditions, uh, uh, uphold the nation? Or what was his uh, dharma to keep his vow? Because at some point it looks like they're contradicting. Even when it was… he had to break his vow, to keep the nation going, he refused to break his vow. And an intelligent man like that, how did he make a contradicting or did I understand it wrong? Intelligence means a certain sense. Is Bhishma the most intelligent man? Definitely not. With little intelligence, he is trying to reach to his ultimate nature. That is his intelligence. With little intelligence, the man is managing to reach his ultimate nature. You have to admit that he is intelligent to that extent, but he is of little intelligence. Why I am saying little intelligence is, anybody who lives by a vow is of little intelligence. People who live by slogans are of lesser intelligence. People who live by scriptures are even lesser intelligence. If you were truly intelligent, you would live by co your consciousness, isn't it? If you were truly intelligent, you would live by consciousness. You set this kind of dharma because you know you are not intelligent enough to manage your life unless you fix a line for yourself. You know that you will for sure flounder if you do not fix a track for yourself. That is the intelligence that he is displaying, you have to acknowledge him for that. And he is sticking to his track. You have to acknowledge his integrity. Integrity, yes. Intelligence, no. Bhishma stands for phenomenal integrity. You can trust this man with anything. He will not go back on his word. But intelligent, no. So, why does he take such a vow? Because that is the only way he can make his life sensible. If he does not have a fixed line for himself, he will get lost. He knows that. And this is the truth with most human beings. If they don't fix a line for themselves, they will get lost. He is intelligent enough to recognize that. I wanted to uh, clarify how… Uh, because uh, Mahabharata… Uh, since uh, King Bharata, uh, um, you briefly mentioned him, I just wanted to clarify how he's related to the Kuru dynasty and why uh, it is called Mahabharata or this nation is called Bharat. So I just wanted to clarify, so King Bharata is the son of uh, Shakuntala and uh, Dushinta. Um, and he had uh, five sons and uh, I didn't get what happened after that, how the five sons are related to the, uh, the Kuru dynasty. Um, I had one more question, just a curiosity, this uh, super son uh, that no, our no, no. solar… Ask one, 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 because uh, you're already taking me back six thousand years and… <laughs> just wanted to know if it's a particular star in our constellation. It is a star. The five suns, the one main reason or one of the important reasons why Bharata is held in such esteem is, all this we are talking about, the whole story is just that, everybody is desperately trying to make their sons the kings. That is the story of monarchy. Well, that is the story of democracy too. <laughs> God damn it. Monarchy means just this, that your children will rule the country. The dream is your children will rule the world. For the first time, an emperor was enlightened enough to see consciously, if he did not have children, that's different. He has his own five children, but he chooses another boy 
for his capability. Though he is labeled as an illegitimate child, he chooses that one and puts him to rule his empire. Oh, okay, he let somebody else rule his empire. That's not a simple thing. People are not even willing to give away their little property to somebody. Even their lousy little property has to go only to their children, yes? Even if it's the size of the grave. A whole empire, he has five sons, but he says, no, they will not make the best kings. This boy will make the best king. It doesn't matter, he has no social standing. It doesn't matter, he has no parentage. It doesn't matter, he doesn't come from the kind of pedigree that people approve of, but he is suitable to be an empire, emperor and he chooses him. That is a huge enlightened way of thinking for a king or an emperor six thousand years ago. You have to bow down to him for that, isn't it? Above all, it's called Bharatvarsh because this was many, many small things. You need to understand the history a little bit because as we use other names, confusions will come because there are stereotypes understanding about these things. When I say Asura, when I say Rakshasa, there are negative connotations to it. But how these things have come is, there are some that they're talking about alien beings, that's different. But largely they're talking about alien tribes. Not anymore, but uh, for some time whenever I went to United States, when I went into the immigration counter, I always had to stand in that counter where it's labeled alien. I think, okay, I'm an alien. And I look at everybody else in the queue, nobody else fits the bill except me <laughs> So, they were alien tribes because the distances were so far away. There was no other communication if people have to go, suppose you lived here, let's say you lived in Velangiri Mountains, at the foothills of Velangiri, five thousand years ago. Would you meet people in Delhi or Haryana? Would you meet a Haryana Jat for any reason? If you had to meet that creature, it was a long journey. It must be your life's ambition to walk all the way to Haryana and meet that man. I am not talking about Europe or Africa or America, I am talking about within India, if you have to meet that man in Haryana who is 2,700 miles away, you would for sure not meet him, isn't it? So, people here thought they are alien tribes. People there thought these are alien tribes. So there are two levels in which they are talking about aliens. Alien tribes, and celestial beings, those who do not belong to this planet, those who belong to this planet but do not belong to our world. Do you understand? Even today, I am <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite amusing. If you go to Midwest America, you will, uh, you will see in some two-bit town, okay, a one-horse town, you go there, it says, world's biggest car dealer. Well, in Wabash, Indiana, the world's biggest car dealer, I think, oh my God, in Wabash, Indiana, the biggest, world's biggest car dealer? Uh, they said, no, no, we'll, we just put like that in the Midwest. <laughs> world's biggest car dealer means, in the next hundred miles, he's the biggest car dealer because the newspaper he reads talks about nothing beyond hundred miles. He lives within that space, so for him that is the world. You… even now, even the major newspapers in United States report like this, Chicago Bulls are uh, playing against uh, whatever, New York Yankees or something and uh, they say it's a world championship.
If United States is playing against some other country, it can be world championship. Chicago Bulls and New York City cannot be world championship, but that is how it is done. I'm saying, in this culture at that time, Bharatvarsh is the world. In this world, there are us and alien tribes, and there are also celestial beings who do not belong to this planet. Now, coming to this aspect of Bharata, why is, in those times, he created the boundaries of the known world. He lived for an extraordinary length of time and he spread the boundaries of his empire more by inclusion than by conquest. Of some of it he conquered, rest of it he included. So, for those times, the largest empire on the planet was Bharata's empire. So the world belonged to him. So it was called Bharat Varsh. This is the world of Bharat, not a nation, please understand. It's the world because there was no other world. This is all the world is. South of Himalayas is the world. Beyond that, aliens lived somewhere. So, he created the world. For those days, he created the boundaries of the world because he spread himself. For the first time, an empire touched the shores of Indian Ocean, so it became Bharatvarsh. And the word Bharat has many meanings. One interesting meaning is Bharata, means it's one of the connotations of his name is Bha means bhava, ra means raga, tha means tala. Bhava, raga, tala means this is the fundamental of music and dance because he established such a stable nation. Everybody was included and he established such a stable nation that people lived in absolute joy music and dance and arts and sciences evolved in such a phenomenal way that his name naturally began to connote that, that bha means emotion or bhava, ra means raga which means the tune, tha means tala, the rhythm. So he became the emotion, the tune and the rhythm of India. So the nation itself took on his name as Bharat. It's unfortunate that uh, since 1947, we largely dropped that name and went for a name that was given to us in recent times by people who conquered this country. That was a huge mistake we have done. It doesn't mean anything. The word India doesn't mean anything, it's a mispronounced word. 